thank you for joining us tonight um, for our uh, Sevens Priorities and Application Forum. Uh, tonight um, is a great opportunity for us to connect um, not just as match officials, but um, any guests we have as well as coaches and managers of people who are uh, involved in Sevens right throughout the, the season. Um, it's been a long time coming, um, obviously a couple of seasons, with uh, season at least, without Sevens uh, last year. So I think everyone's chomping at the bit uh, to get back into it. Uh, so tonight, just a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, um, just feel free to um, ask any questions at any time. You can either uh, pop them in the chat, type them in. Uh, we'll address these as we go or at the end. Um, or it will also give an opportunity for questions at the end as well. Um, and keep microphones off, please, if you can, just while others are speaking. Um, and that way, and if you're struggling with the internet connection there, if it's a bit skippy and jumpy, uh, turning off your own video actually uh, can improve the quality of the call, might help you out a bit. Um, and also, as I said, uh, the workshop's being recorded. Uh, we'll make it available as a resource uh, to connect and share with everyone involved in Sevens later on. So tonight, um, we'll be covering a number of things and they'll be reasonably surface level, but they should be, create a bit of an insight at least into the way in which we shape the game of Sevens. Um, particularly from a match officials perspective and then coaches and managers in particular can help to um, uh, coach and shape their teams uh, to how the referees referee I guess is the is, is one of the main purposes so I'll be going through our objectives um, we'll cover some key law differences um, and that we have in sevens talk about a few things like mouth guards replacements and sidelines uh, and assistant referees then we'll get stuck into the priorities of the game uh, particularly around foul play positioning uh, lightning quick ball scrums and continuity um, and then we'll uh, just cover off a, a couple of bits around our tournament schedule this year um, i'll show you a couple of resources um, recap our, res uh, our objectives and make sure we cover off any other questions at the end cool so our objectives tonight and what we want to nail uh, so really we want to understand how laws apply differently to suit the game of sevens and it's the um, how the referees use the law to facilitate a quick flowing game um, we'll also highlight some key differences in all between sevens and 15 side. Um, we want to try and create some consistency in our refereeing across our sevens tournaments, um, regardless of grade. Um, but at least um, so teams can know and referees can know when they go from tournament to tournament um, what they're in store for. Um, we want to try and create a better understanding of refereeing priorities and application during sevens tournaments, um, not just for our referees, but also for, like, as I've mentioned, for our coaches and managers too, so that they understand what's going on in the game. Uh, from a refereeing perspective and also provide opportunities to ask questions and share thoughts and experiences and I know looking at the uh, people on the call tonight that we have a, a wide range of experience um, in sevens uh, with us tonight so um, please uh, for those who do have sevens experience please make sure that you do um, speak up add to uh, if you see any golden opportunities for a bit of insight um, definitely we need uh, we want to hear that because uh, it's a great opportunity to learn and to share as well Oh, so first of all, our, our key law differences. Um, so um, I'm not going to go through in complete detail, so you can visit uh, the World Rugby website for the absolute detail on those. And also just bearing in mind that some tournaments will vary uh, some some laws or some rules um, just within their tournaments too. Uh, but these are the basics and these are, I guess, it give a good feel of the game of sevens. So obviously we've got seven minute halves. Um, we have a two minute half time and, and two minutes in bin. Um, in terms of numbers, we have uh, seven aside, um, hence the name, and we have five on the bench um, in sevens as well, and three in the scrum. Uh, we don't have any goal line dropouts or 50-22s in sevens, uh, so that has been adopted into full law for 15s, but has been specifically excluded for sevens, and um, which you can find in the law book as well. Uh, and in terms of kicks, uh, a lot of the differences are evolved around kicks, uh, so rest restarts and kickoffs. Um, we, uh, any infringements around those, uh, typically a free kick instead of the scrum options. Um, we have, uh, the kicks must be taken within 30 seconds. So that's things like conversions and restart kicks. And uh, it's really, and we, and particularly at our community uh, sevens events, we really put the onus on the um, scoring team to retrieve the ball. Uh, they're the ones that restart. So after they have an attempt at conversion, uh, it's on them to retrieve the ball and get it back. We're not uh, don't usually have a lot of ball kids running around at all our community events. So um, yeah, we really put the onus on there uh, onto those players. Um, and all kicks at goal must be a drop kick um, from the field of play. And we do have some standards around that where we don't have kicks from behind the posts. 
um, and those kicks cannot be charged down, unlike in 15s. Cool, so uh, just a reminder of our mouth guards. Um, wanted to highlight this in particular. Um, for some reason, there's a bit of a, uh, sometimes a, a thought out there that you don't need mouth guards in sevens. Um, it's very much the opposite, you absolutely do. Um, so they are compulsory. The only exception is a medical certificate. Uh, it's pretty simple, no mouth guard, no play. Um, what we'd really um, drive with our referees is that uh, they're checking with the players, um, particularly early in the day, we set, them, set some standards early. Um, and it might be that very, very early on, you might get a bit of a, you might get a warning and say, hey, go get your mouth guard. Um, after that, you, you, there probably won't be too many warnings. And just be mindful that uh, yellow cards can, and red cards can be used for no mouth guards if there are um, infringements or repeat infringements from a team. So um, pretty simple. Make sure everyone's got a mouth guard. If you're a team coach or manager, make sure there's a few spares, a few extras in case someone doesn't bring these uh, and everyone will be able to participate and have a great day. Uh, so replacements, um, uh, just so we don't go down the path of rugby league, uh, they are only made at a stoppage in play. Um, so line out, scrum, injury, try, etc. Um, and and with the ref referee's permission, and what we mean by that is at least try and get the uh, bring it to the referee's attention that you are making a sub. Um, yell out across the the, the, the field, uh, subs using. Uh, uh, use an AR if, if need be, but um, do get their permission. The referee will most times allow that to happen. Um, there's no sideline managers in place typically at our seven tournaments, um, but sometimes there are some field managers, particularly at our Bay of Plenty run events, so they may be able to provide some assistance as well around that too in terms of getting the referee's attention and um, helping to facilitate those. Um, again, replacement rules do vary quite a bit in sevens, uh, depending on the tournament, um, but in terms of the standard rules that, uh, so in if in the absence of any variations, um, all grades uh, have can name five on the bench. Uh, so they have a team of up to 12, essentially. Um, grades at 16, under 16s and below, uh, we would expect a half game will be applied. So the easiest application for that is to have these make, uh, make all the replacements at half time, uh, roll your five on, and then everyone gets half a game. All other grades, um, then you can the subs operate in the same way. There was a law trial around just having five replacements interchangeably, uh, which um, the real world rugby have since done away with. So the the subs replacements work in the same way as 15s. You just have less people on the bench. Um, so you can bring someone on tactically, um, bring you know some bring someone off tactically, I should say, um, and that person can only go back on um, if they're required to cover an injury or blood or something like that. So uh, just bear that in mind um, when making your subs, but also take, pay particular attention to the competition rules as well, because some of them will allow in some grades you know, unlimited substitutions or things like that. But no matter what, they are always made at a stoppage, and I've yet to see anything uh, to the contrary to that in rugby, um, at our tournaments at least anyway. Uh, Sidelines, so pretty key around this as well. Um, at, our sevens events, or most sevens events, have played a really good spirit. Uh, sevens is a great time of year where everyone's really enjoying their rugby. The weather's usually pretty good. Um, and fun is a pretty key word. And we want to make sure that everyone involved has fun. So both the all participants, everyone involved. So uh, everyone there is a volunteer, essentially. Uh, the match officials, the players, the coaches. Um, respect is number one thing. So let's just make sure that we're having, it's a, it's a pretty core cool value of rugby. Uh, let's make sure that we are showing respect to everyone involved. Uh, if we don't agree with something, just bottle it, just deal with it in your own personal way without taking it out on someone else. Um, so even within your own teams, um, the coaches and managers, um, and even match officials as well, um, something, uh, go through the right channels essentially to deal with, deal with any issues. Um, uh, the way, one way we can actually keep our sidelines pretty pretty tidy and pretty positive as well is is not to be yelling out and co and uh, yelling out stuff at the uh, at at the ground other than other than actual um, support for what's happening. So um, if we're calling out instructions and decisions and you know uh, you know calling for decisions or remonstrating or things like that, it serves no purpose but to make everything worse. It doesn't actually make anything better ever. <laughs> makes you angry or makes you know, makes people around you upset uh, and it distracts everyone on the field and it just goes pear shaped. So let's just make sure we keep ourselves in check. Um, and uh, if, you, if you don't agree with the decision, come again, right channel is to come uh, see the referee manager. Uh, if you really feel strongly about it and want to come and have a conversation later about, about it later, um, 
uh, then yeah, come and have a conversation with uh, with us over in the, uh, in terms of referee management or tournament management. But essentially, approaching referee if you don't agree with the decision will never be a great, never be a good thing. So just don't do it. Um, technical zones exist now. They may or may not be marked, and this vary from ground to ground, but they do exist and they are utilised. So our expectation is that all teams and team management, coaches, etc., remain within those technical areas. So if you can imagine a seven by three metre box or thereabouts that intersects each of the ten metre lines on the same side of the field, that's where they would be. Um, usually they have chairs set out or things like that. Um, but regardless of whether they are or aren't marked, the expectation is that that's where teams remain for the duration of the game. Um, train medics can roam. Um, there's not a lot of train medics that typically hang around sevens events, um, other than what's provided by the tournament staff sometimes. Um, so if someone's just acting as the first responder, but they're just essentially a water carrier, then they've got to remain in the in the tech zone as well. They can't roam up and down the side. Um, and same with replacements as well. Um, last thing is that um, abuse won't be tolerated. So anything anyone uh, found to be abusing referees or match officials or volunteers in general, to be fair, um, will be dealt with pretty severely. Um, haven't really had to deal with that a lot, lot of our sevens events in particular. Again, it's played in a positive environment, so I'm I'm sure that it won't be an issue. Um, but again, stating it for the record, so we don't have any issues at all. And lastly, just before we dive into our priorities, um, just around our ARs and touch judges. Um, so each team, uh, each team is expected to provide a touch judge. Um, for every match that is in a final. Uh, typically, um, ARs are appointed to a final. So um, a few tips here for both referees and for teams is that um, if you have someone, if the teams have someone ready to go, um, queued up ahead of the game or ahead of the tournament or even on rotational basis, that usually works best uh, rather than the referee having to stop and ask and and then wait and then you know all of a sudden a couple of minutes to tick by and the game gets off late so it can really help the facilitation of the game so for teams to turn up you know on time or early a couple of minutes early for their field have someone ready to go to pick up the flag and go um, and referees make sure that you don't start a game until you do have someone on each side um, uh, you'll really miss them when you when you when you have a, a, a crucial corner decision or, or or touch decision and you're 15 25 30 meters in field um, some of us run just between the goalposts. So uh, it's a lot harder to see the uh, the touch lines from there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so do make sure you have someone running touch at least for you. Um, and we the expectation around that is that it's just one of the touch judges or ARs heads under the sticks uh, for a kick at goal. We don't need both of them burning energy to get in there. Um, and if it's in front of the post, it's typically it's taken too quickly anyway, and the referee will be onto it to, to watch that. So, um, but yeah. Um, just um, it's a few tips for everyone involved there um, so we can so help facilitate that. Those are a few nuts and bolts things just around tournaments themselves. Um, before I dive into the game priorities, does anyone have any questions or anything to add just around what we've covered so far? Cool, five golden seconds of silence. Fantastic, I'll carry on. Okay, our sevens game priorities. So. The game itself of sevens, um, obviously fewer players, less time, more space, quicker play. Um, and a lot of uh, people do see as a, as a more, I guess, pure form of the game. Um, pictures or what you're looking at in terms of uh, in terms of breakdowns um, in particular um, uh, are a lot simpler. Uh, and, um, and a lot of people do prefer to either both play and referee sevens. Uh, because of this and uh, obviously our priorities and the way that we apply the law in terms of refereeing um, really aims to keep that ball in play for as long as possible. We want it's only 14 minutes long. You burn a minute here, a minute there, mucking around and wasting time. Then all of a sudden you've lost a lot of game time. So really it's for um, keeping the ball in play, um, give everyone a fair, a fair crack at uh, achieving their purpose and a fair opportunity, obviously, um, to a fair contest is, is what we're after too. So. Uh, we'll go through our different priorities to see how we can achieve this. Uh, firstly, foul play. Um, so foul play can look a little bit different. Uh, it is, is, is the same, but there are, there are some things that pop up more often in sevens that you would notice, particularly either from watching it or being involved in it. Um, so obviously we want to keep the game safe and positive. Um, that word positive uh, is, is a really key word in there as well as safe. Um, so what we mean by that is that any negative play or, uh, or things that are foul play that have a negative impact on the game, um, 
then they're typically dealt with a bit more severely. So that that's deliberate acts in particular. Uh, so things like throwing or kicking away the ball, um, not, not not freeing it up and not allowing it. If you know the game of sevens or if you've ever seen it, you know how yeah, that quick taps are golden. Um, if a, a team's able to retrieve that ball, get a quick tap going, um, all of a sudden catching the defence on the back foot, um, they, can, they can gain more than the 10 metres that they've they've been given for the for the actual sanction itself. So um, delaying or slowing down that process to give the allow the defenders to get back is a big no-no, and uh, match officials should be dealing with that pretty severely. Um, again, I think a bit of empathy is also um, uh, a, a word that comes in here. So having a bit of empathy for the grades that we are referring. So um, the different. What I mean by that is, if we're refereeing um, an under 14s game uh, with um, players who might be playing their first, it might be their first experience of rugby, um, or um, reasonably low grade day day one, game one, and maybe it's having a bit of empathy for someone who's standing there with the ball and not really under sure, not really sure what's going on. Maybe they're not actually trying to intentionally slow the play down. Having a bit of empathy to deal with that in that situation, that might change a bit, a few a couple of games in on that day. Um, it would look very different to a premier men's, you know, game where they if they're running away with the ball, holding it, preventing it from being, <laughs> from being or, or just tossing it behind them. They know exactly what they're doing. They are slowing the play down. So uh, it's, it's understanding what the grade is, what the game is, and applying a sanction accordingly. But certainly for any. Um, for any uh, negative play, intentional negative play, um, referees in sevens will typically penalise and yellow card. Um, and although it's only two minutes, that sanction is pretty big in sevens. So pretty simple message. Um, no negative play. Keep the ball available for those who can, who are entitled to play with it. Um, and away you go from there. So things like deliberate knock-ons. Um, the pictures we uh, want to uh, see around that is... Um, uh, if you're sticking your hand out to in, try and intercept or anything like that, or intentionally sticking your hand out to get your hand to the ball, unless you realistically can catch it again, um, and it knocks, if you knock it on, you're, that's, a, that's, a, that's a yellow card in sevens any day of the week. So um, the way that referees will be looking at that is that um, you'd have to really be able to try and catch that ball again and be in a position to be able to do that um, after you've got your hand to it the first time. Um, tipping it up. It doesn't make a difference. It might give you a better chance of that, but um, in reality, if that ball gets away from you, you couldn't really catch it again, you're gone. Uh, that's that's the key there. Um, again, things like lifting tackles, um, uh, I guess it's a bit of um, just around that in sevens, you get probably less bodies in there, so sometimes players can remain a bit less upright. If you, um, if you go into a lifting type tackle, you don't have other players around to sort of support or... Um, Wedge at player against, so just be careful. I guess making sure that players are being careful around that and uh, are, uh, and are lowering players safely to the ground. Um, and uh, and as we talked about before, with the throwing and kicking the ball away, um, quick taps are golden. So if a player is not is deliberately not back ten at a quick tap, they're only a couple of meters back, and they and they interfere with play. Again, that's a that's a yellow card um, all the time. It's an intentional act. Uh, and again, having some empathy for the grade for the game situation first game of a under 14s inexperienced type game might look a little bit different where player might not even know what's going on so having some empathy and being able to referees hopefully being able to facilitate the game there um, but that would look a bit different as a, as a tournament uh, more on um, so what we're looking for our referees in particular around foul play um, is, to, is to blow foul play up pretty quickly um, and just like most penalties in in um, sevens at all then we have uh, little to almost never have an advantage uh, for foul play. It's blown up straight away um, unless there's an imminent scoring opportunity. Um, that penalty is blown, the sanction dealt with, and then we carry on um, once that once that occurs. Cool. All right, this one's mostly for referees. Um, so um, the referees will be keen to join uh, to uh, to tune in here in particular, um, but. Again, useful learning for coaches and managers too. So what we're looking for as referees is ball in line. Uh, we are looking to, so that is us in line with the ball as to where, uh, for, for passes, essentially we are horizontal with the ball um, at as many times as possible throughout the game. 
So what does that look like in sevens? Um, unlike fifteens, where we would probably get a bit closer to the action in terms of breakdowns, a lot more bodies, a lot more going on. We'd have a lot less of that again. Much easier to see what's happening at a tackle or a breakdown in sevens, even from a little bit further away. Uh, so um, the key, the key part of sevens is being able to keep up with the play, um, be able to see uh, those little forward passes or those little infringements, um, and not being stuck behind the play because it breaks out so quickly. It is a game that changes so fast and can go either direction. Uh, so if we're caught too far behind, or if we're caught too far ahead, and the play starts going the other way or away from us. Uh, as referees, um, it's um, then it can make a big difference. Um, so we need to try and be in, in line with the ball as much as possible. To do that, we square up the field, so we run straight lines, um, essentially up and down or north and south between the goal between the goalposts is one that you have to work really hard at. Um, so um, that's uh, again, some people run a little bit more up and down than left to right uh, than others. And that's okay. Um, if, depending on your uh, fitness level, ability, you might narrow your field quite a bit more than, than some. Um, I know that some people tend to put some age markers on it and think, right, if you're under, if you're in your 20s, you're definitely running out to as far as the 15s or thereabouts. And if you're 35, 40 plus and a little bit slower, maybe you're narrowing that in a little bit close to the goalpost. But no, it, it's up to you and what and what your what your ability is. The key thing is that up and down the field is a really really key as um, uh, place to run because you're keeping that ball in line as much as possible. When we do need to go in um, to have a look at a breakdown or a tackle, um, then we can get ball in line first, then we can come across. So we're running some really square lines um, or little little steps up, up, up the field rather than big sweeping um, runs where we can let, be left behind very quickly and burn a lot of energy. Um, and in terms of uh, quick taps, um, referees should be work, really working really hard to ensure that uh, there's a mark given um, for a quick tap. That's not to say you've got to run all the way over there and put your foot in the ground and say, here's our here's our mark for a quick tap. But certainly um, facilitating um, the attacking team to be able to take that tap quickly. It might be as simple as a penalty given and pointing to a mark, say, yep, the uh, mark's on you or something to that effect uh, so that play can get underway um, ASAP. Um, ideal position for, uh, for for a tap is to be behind the ball um, or behind the player, uh, not directly behind them. You won't be able to see the tap being taken, but maybe just slightly offset, basically in a position where you are out of the way for the next play. Um, but also you've got everything in front of you in terms of what you need to be looking at. So you've got your defenders. Um, you, can, you can scan right across. You've got your bum towards the um, attacking goal line and everyone that you need to be worried about is in front of you and you can see what's going on. Uh, you can also use your body then referees to uh, your arms to uh, direct people, push people back if they need to retire 10 metres, things like that. So essentially square up your body, uh, make sure that the mark is um, available for, uh, and in whatever way you need to make it available for the attacking team to take that quick tap. Just on those first two slides um, around foul play and positioning, um, is anyone got any pearls of wisdom or questions to add in here at, the, at this time? No, awesome. Five golden se seconds. Excellent. Alrighty, lightning quick ball. Um, what we really want to achieve in uh, in sevens, um, just like a, a lot of formats of the game, but particularly sevens, is uh, tidy breakdowns and quick ball or quick decisions. So we're not here to muck around, play advantage, get in there, say, you know, try and figure out what's happening. Uh, it is, okay, has that ball come out quickly? No. Nope. Is, there, is there a turnover? Is there a quick turnover? No. Nope. All right, I need to make a quick decision. What has happened? Why has that ball not come out? Or why is that player who's legally able to turn it over not been able to turn it over? So the dominant legal players are being rewarded uh, at that at that breakdown. Um, obviously, you need to be clear and consistent and some go to decisions. So these are um, uh, knowing what what you're looking for uh, at each at each breakdown in each tackle. So our tackle assists. So those those players who don't. So those people who help help out with the tackle, but don't go to ground. Um, are they clearly releasing the tackled player um, before they invariably they will be the first person who try and have it to try and steal the ball. So do they, do they release the player? Do they show some daylight at least, or they show that their hands are clear of the of the body uh, before they have a go at trying to steal the ball or jackal the ball? 
Um, that's that's the one to look out for. Uh, tacklers, are they rolling away? Again, is this that little split second? If they're on the wrong side and if they have any interference whatsoever for an arriving support player, a halfback um, coming to clear the ball quickly, um, that's, a, again, a, that that second, that half second makes all the difference in, in, uh, in sevens. If that ball gets out quickly and is clear quickly, but if that if the um, then they can attack. If that player is slowed down, that, that, that delivery of the ball, that, that makes a difference for defensive lines being able to get back. So we're dealing with the tacklers not rolling away um, if they're having that impact on play. Um, so tacklers should know that. And again, coaches, if we're thinking about that, we should really be trying to make sure that our tacklers are rolling out of the way as quickly as possible, or at least tackling and falling uh, out of the way to start with is probably the best solution. Uh, ball carrier is not releasing. Um, so again, do, does a legal jackler get there? Do they get over the ball? They've shown a clear release. They're on their feet and supporting their weight. Um, and the ball carrier is holding on. It's usually a very easy penalty to see. Um, you know, they've got us to make sure that the, 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 that that person, though, that is jackling the ball needs to show a clear lift. Can they clearly lift the ball? That proves that they are really supporting their weight. You know, they can't just sort of rest their hands there or just wrap their arms around a body. Um, but they, uh, again, read the situation is... Um, is the uh, is the ball carrier releasing that ball, or are they trying to uh, prevent that ball carrier from getting it? Uh, make the decision there. So make sure that these are quick go-to decisions. Make sure you know what that picture looks like in your head. Um, and arriving players um, and coaches in particular, you could want to think about when you're coaching this. Um, so co players who aren't supporting their body weight or have hands on the ground, um, a key a D set giveaway is. Um, play, uh, you see quite, a, see quite a bit in sevens with players that are reaching right over. So essentially, if you took out the bodies or the or the ball or anything below them, if they would fall straight to the ground because they can't hold themselves up, even though they might not be touching the ground necessarily, they might be hands on the ball, yeah, but leaning right over. Okay, uh, that's what we're looking for. That's not supporting your body weight. They're, they need to be supporting their body weight on their own two feet and not using anything that's already on the ground to do that. Um, so. Uh, or then they can't be using the ground to stop themselves um, and going over the ball first, stop themselves from falling over, and then coming back and trying to steal that ball. Um, so be aware of that and make sure that we're co um, coaching that well around um, doing everything right to be able to steal that ball or win that turnover. Cool. And really what we're looking for, um, referees, probably to have a bit more of a technical than a tactical approach. Um, again, quick game. It's, it's hard to read too much into things like advantage. We'll talk about advantage shortly anyway, but um, rather than trying to think tactically what's trying to, what's trying to happen in the game, we've got a, we've got an offence here. It's, it's had an impact. That make sure it's the first one that you're getting, if you can. Hopefully you're in a position to see that, uh, and then you're making that decision um, so that the play can continue. All right. Scrums. Um, some people might raise, raise their eyebrows and think scrums don't matter too much at sevens. Um, and certainly in grades that um, where we have uncontested scrums, you're probably correct. But they can become quite a sticky point of contention, um, particularly late in the day of a, of, a, of a tournament that where scrums have not been managed well. So uh, again, we're trying to get the ball back and play quickly and fairly as the objective here. 3v3 three three three, three three scrums, and typically you don't have a lot of players who are used to scrummaging um, in there, even though they're, um, they've been trained up to scrum in sevens. So, um, but the referees still need to maintain some standards around how these scrum, scrums look uh, and the way that they play out so that they are fair uh, and the ball does, we do get the ball back and play um, quickly um, and they're also even keeping everyone safe. Uh, scrum feeds, um, again, this is where we can have some empathy, maybe even a little bit of coaching sometimes, um, referees just to help out some of our less experienced players. Um, again, Sevens is a platform which is used by a lot of um, a lot of uh, age grade teams, young age grade teams to get players into the game. Um, so you may get a, um, a halfback in there who has never played that position before. You often get a lot of players in there who have never played halfback before and aren't used to feeding scrums. Um, so making sure our, our scrum feeds are legal, ball on two hands and fed in. Again, credible is the is the main thing. Um, so long as you're not stuck in them behind the, uh, it's pretty much into the back of the scrum behind the feet and then they're popping straight out again. Uh, if it's going into the tunnel um, and is reasonably straight and it's consistent both ways, 
um, that's what we're looking for. It gets the ball in and it's credible. What we don't want to see is ball held on one hand or put in there and and then done one and then one of these sort of pushed you know, stuck into the tunnel with the hand and then pushed backwards. You see that quite a bit with inexperienced players um, or for scrums that aren't set up well. So uh, we can manage that as referees in particular, um, just around a bit of advice, a bit of guidance, blowing it up and re resetting that one early in the day so that we don't have any issues with it come the second game of the day. Um, get it sorted early and then go from there. Again, empathy for the grade, understanding of the grade that we're at. If we're talking about senior men's um, senior men's rugby who um, should know what they're doing and are, you know, are well trained to do that, then again, we can blow the infringement straight away early to set the standard and then go from there. Um, and one other thing we see quite a bit in sevens as well is props. So when you have three players bound in the in the scrum of the same team, the props will bind onto each other, and the hooker won't actually be bound uh, to the props. They'll just be sort of popped in between, and the and the and the and the and the hop, props arms will go right over and onto their onto the other props back. Uh, what we need to see, and this is quite an easy thing, if you, if referees are going through their crouch bind set and watching. Uh, the setup. Um, we need to make sure that the props are bound to the hooker. Each prop is bound to the hooker. The reason for this is that um, props will then. Um, the reason that props won't bind there, that they'll then um, pop out underneath and get out of the scrum really quickly because they won't be bound. Um, so, it's uh, it's illegal. It causes a bit. It causes a fair bit of disruption and chaos in, in a scrum as well. Um, particularly if if there's a bit of a push or a bit of a shove or things don't go right as well. So it uh, can be unsafe. It is illegal and it's a tactic which shouldn't be used. So let's just make sure we're setting up scrums well there. Cool. Um, but at, at the end of the day, we, do, we don't want to have any or many um, reset scrums. Uh, we want to get the ball in or out or make a decision. That's, and that's, that's it. So um, a few, a few go-tos as well for referees, um, what we're looking for. So um, not pushing straight. Um, in particular, um, the loose head of the non-feeding team will push around. Um, kicking the ball out is a, an offence that you see a bit more in, 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 in sevens, seeing as there's less players in there to get it past. So the non-feeding team in particular trying to kick the ball out of the scrum, whether it's through or out the side. Uh, that's a straight penalty in, in sevens rather than a free kick. Um, Obviously, your collapsing and your binding issues uh, that we have, if, if that causes the scrum to uh, to falter or we don't get ball in, ball out. Um, but early shove is quite a is quite a common one as well. Teams pushing before the ball's in, uh, so making sure that we're again blowing the sanction straight away, getting out of there, ball in, ball out, all decision, um, and not muck, not mucking around, not wasting time with resetting scrums. We just carry on, and um, then players often won't think twice about it once you've blown your whistle. So we get on with it. Alrighty, and our last main one around our priorities is continuity. So we really want the non-infringing team. Uh, we want to reward them and keep the ball in play. So this is where we can. Uh, this is uh, where we talk about the likes of uh, advantage um, and what referees can do just to uh, just to keep the game moving. So um, again, time uh, time is so precious. We talked about it a few times tonight already. Time is so precious in the game of sevens. Um, so. The, I guess the mantra uh, for referees is blow and go. So just blow the whistle and let's go. Um, we want the ball in play. Um, we don't want to muck around. Um, no, standing there, so yeah, blowing your whistle up, you're not rolling away, I need you to roll away next time and having a big yard about or this or that or whatever or getting a whole bunch of signals and you know looking more fancy schmancy. No, it's quick whistle, decision, make sure that, if, that the team who's won that penalty or won that free kick is knows where the mark is and let's get on with it. If a referee has time then for a second for a secondary uh, signal, sure, get one in. That's a bonus. That's that's not an expectation. Um, so main thing is a primary signal the, to the team who do, who should be getting the ball knows they're going to get the ball and we go from there. Um, verbals uh, come in handy as well. So something short and sharp. Um, penalty not rolling. As a penalty, not rolling, marks there. Or, you know, I'll blow your whistle, shh, marks there, not rolling away. Or something like that. Really quick, really to the point. Players are not going to stick around and try and question your decision because that quick that quick tap gets taken and away we go no, straight away. Make it clear, make it strong, um, so that everyone knows by your whistle and where your arm's pointing straight away that what the next thing to, that, that's happening is um, so that teams can get underway again. 
Advantage. Uh, advantage is very minimal um, to almost non-existent in the game of sevens. Um, so um, it should be immediate. Uh, and we, when we talk about advantage, we're really probably only talking about um, knock-on advantage, so a scrum advantage, sorry, not knock-on advantage, a scrum advantage. So where there's a scrum infringement, um, you, can, you can play advantage, obviously, but you're identifying time and space, opportunities for um, uh, for, for teams. Um, essentially, the advantage can be tactical. Once team has um, clear ball or um, has clean ball, I should say, and has got a you know, control pass um, and starts moving the ball, advantage is over. Um, they've controlled the ball. They've got. They've, uh, they're, they're not under pressure in that, in that sense. Um, so long as they haven't gone, you know, we're forced back into their own goal or like really under pressure within their own five or, or something like that. If they're out in the middle of the field, they've controlled the ball and they've, and they've made a pass, away we go, advantage over. Um, that's it. In terms of penalty kick or a free kick, um, the actual penalty kick or the free kick itself is the advantage. What we mean by that is that when once that whistle blows and that mark is available um, for the quick uh, the quick tap, the teams will be able to utilise that better than mucking around playing an advantage. You know, playing an advantage. Oh, no advantage there. After a couple of phases, let's come back for the penalty, and then you've wasted. 20 seconds of the game, 30 seconds of the game, which is a massive, massive percentage. Um, and then by the time you come back for the penalty, you made the mark, all the defenders are back 10, and then what has the team got out of it? You're not, you're not gonna, you're typically not going to kick for a touch and try and maul over the line like in 15s. So penalties and free kicks, unless there is an imminent opportunity for a, for a, uh, for a line break or um, a, a try immediately, then there's no, then that's, they, they blow it up. No advantage from there. Um, and again, for foul plays, uh, trying uh, referees in particular, <clears throat> if there's um, there's foul play that needs to be dealt uh, dealt with, sorry, foul play warnings, I should say. So any warnings that need to be delivered, uh, typically do these on the go. Um, so captains, um, players on 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 the move in between times, um, but uh, if 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 there is repeat infringements. Or things like that, then typically you do have the opportunity at a penalty to say, yeah, no more of that while you're uh, while while you made that penalty. Typically, blowing time off, calling your run for a big hooey, doing all that kind of stuff um, is uh, is not great management in a game of sevens where there's opportunity to play the game quickly. Um, if you're stopping to talk to someone, then typically you're sending them to the bin um, because you've already down down the path of. Um, uh, of 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 that process. So, um, if you're blowing time off, come over here. All right. Um, I've, I've asked you guys already. Uh, to, to, to too many penalties down here. Wait. Um, two minutes in the bin. Go. It's not having a big explanation. Again, you show the yellow card. The player jogs off. Um, get the game going again. So, um, uh, even even at those uh, yellow card moments, red cards might be slightly different. Um, typically they would relate to a very serious offence. Just like in the game of 15s, so you may it may require slightly bit more time and be a bit let because it is a fairly game changing decision. It can be particularly if it's early in the game, so you may require a bit more consideration and um, actually bring a captain in and say, "Hey, look, you know, here's what I've seen. This player has done this. It's very dangerous. Where we go, that kind of thing." Um, but that would be really the only um, uh, the only thing for that. So yeah. Cool. All right. Um, before I just wrap up with the last little bit around our tournaments and some resources, um, anything, any questions uh, so far or anything that we've got to add from our experts that we have sitting around here? Yeah, i got one. Uh, don't turn up late to your game. <laughs> or you yep. might find the game started without you. Yeah, we won't, we won't be starting a game without a team. <laughs> But certainly, definitely, um, can we just, yeah, like Reese said, um, for the sake of everyone involved, both match officials and teams, be there on time. I mean, on time means a couple minutes early, be at your field. Uh, tournaments run to really tight schedules, so it's really important for everyone's sake um, to respect that and to make sure we turn up on time. It'd be great. JD, did we want to try, I'm not too sure what, What's going on with your microphone there, mate? Did you want to try something else or just unplugging it, plugging it again if it's a mic or what's going on there?
or you can try typing it in the chat if you want to type it in there and I can just finish up. You type it in the chat if you can, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through this bit and I'll come back to it. All right, our tournament schedule. Um, so this, these are for Bay Plenty hosted um, events that uh, we are a part of or that we know about at least. Um, so um, our Baywide events in particular, uh, we've got our secondary school girls and boys coming up. Those are the first ones off, off the first cabs off the rank. They start next week, uh, which is very exciting. So girls on the Wednesday, boys on Saturday. Um, and all of our Baywide events are held out at Pine Godoa. Um, our Super 8 Sevens is a new new event this year. It's not it's not run by Bay Pretty Rugby. It's, uh, it's hosted by uh, Rotorua Boys College. Oh, sorry, Rotorua Boys High School, and involves all of these Super 8 um, schools um, playing their sevens, their boys sevens teams. And it has um, and it has uh, also um, under 15s boys and girls as well involved with that, which is pretty cool. Um, and it's a two-day event as well, so the Saturday in particular is what we need uh, referees for, um, match officials um, of supporting of all kinds of, and uh, um, also in all kinds of ways. Um, we then get into our Bayway Club Sevens as well, which is our, I guess, our, our pinnacle event for our senior men and women. Um, again, at Pongado, that's a great day, and, and match officials as well. There'll be our traditional. Um, barbecue and um, bring your whanau along, even if you're not involved in sevens um, and the actual match, of, match officiating, uh, come along and enjoy that. That's always a good time. Um, our youth club sevens is a, is a is one that hadn't got off the ground just yet because of COVID, but it's a great concept. It's our it's our youth, uh, sorry, our um, sc secondary school age um, uh, players playing for their clubs, um, which is really cool. So. Uh, quite a lot of entries is that uh, getting uh, coming in for that too. Um, so it'd be really cool to see that get off the ground and um, and those players wearing their club colours again, probably the first time since they were in JAB. Uh, Kati Kati Sevens as well are on, which is pretty cool. A new, new event this year, uh, Condor Sevens, which is a, a great big event up in Auckland. Um, it involves um, a, a four-day event uh, with two separate events run within it, uh, each two days long each. So that, get in touch with Auckland um, referees in particular for that. Um, and we're waiting some detail for the details, but there's some beach rugby, which isn't sevens, but will be um, uh, played with beach rugby rules. It's five aside. Uh, tackle rugby here on Mount Monganui Beach, which will be pretty cool that weekend in January. And then we get into January, sorry, and then we had the Mount Sevens uh, underway again, and that looking to expand that uh, next year. And I'm just waiting to hear the um, the grades and everything that will be confirmed for that. But that'll be expanded from out from the one field that it was last time, which will be pretty cool. And then our North Island Secondary School Sevens in March, which is another amazing event, this this time held in uh, Gretton. We're expecting as well um, Arataki 10s and Tapuna 10s to be held too, so we'll await details for those. And again, 10s played in a very similar vein to 7s, um, just slightly more people on the field. Um, but other than that, it's a lot of the same principles. And, uh, and speaking of which, um, uh, um, just what JD's popped in the in the, in the the chat there. So things around is near enough, close enough for penalties. Great point and one I overlooked. Absolutely. Um, so long as it's not taken ridiculously ahead of the, uh, ahead of the mark, um, particularly if you're in the middle of the field, if you can see, uh, I guess a simple thing for match officials would be to say to players, um, look, you know, uh, even ahead of the game, um, look, uh, halfback in particular or someone like that, look, if you've got a quick tap, just make sure it's in front of me um, so that you can see it being taken. Uh, so in front of your vision, I should say. Um, and But it's really on the referee as well to be able to open up be aware of what's happening, where the ball is, and what's going to happen. So, um, referees really should be in a, in a position to be able to see where that tap's been taken. But yep, essentially, uh, if it's you know um, a meter, you know, w w within a reasonable distance um, either side of the mark, anywhere behind it is is what we're going for. Um, and and you know, if, you know, if it's a half step in front, not the end of the world, unless I guess it, like you know, unless it's five minutes from the line you know probably, you definitely don't want tax taken five minutes you know, within that five um it's got to come back to that line so yeah 100 percent uh that's a great facilitation um little rule there to get the game going again and again it reiterates the point that referees absolutely be aware that teams want to play quickly get them make the mark available in whatever way you can be aware of what's happening where the defense is and that mark being that that tap being taken and I guess just on that as well, um, 
uh, taps actually being taken correctly is a, is a bit of a, a bit of a thing too. So the ball has to leave, leave the hands and move a visible distance. Um, and so the ball, if the ball is put on the ground, it has to move move a visible distance in any direction on the ground um, through a, through through way of a kick. Um, so um, a player just stomping on top of the ball and the ball just sort of staying, you know, wobbling on the ground doesn't constitute a kick. You know, the ball hasn't moved a visible distance along the ground. Uh, the other way of doing it is to release the ball from your hands, kick it, and then, well, I mean, kick it so it's not in your hands rather than a rugby league style tap where you're just tapping it with your hand against your foot. Again, this is where the empathy comes in. So younger grades, inexperienced referees can really help facilitate this. Don't settle for an incorrect tap, but have some empathy around what's happening. A player maybe who doesn't have a lot of experience around that. So say, hey, no, come early in the day, early in the tournament. Hey, come back here. So we do it, the ball on the ground and kick it, or ball has to leave your hands and go from there. Get them to do it again. Vice versa, um, high grades, a more, more elite rugby, or more experienced rugby, I should say. Um, sanction it early if it's incorrect. Uh, and then that'll that'll set the standard itself. So yeah, cool. Anything else, guys? Um, just before I just show these last, I'll, I'll show these last resources, and then I'll go. So I'm gonna I've, I'm gonna um, pop these slides up on the website anyway, so you'll be able to click these links. But um, I've met, there's a referee seven uh, referee development page with a couple of links and resources there. Uh, some seven, the link to the sevens law variations as well for the World Rugby website. Um, for coaches and and even for referees just to ha broaden their knowledge of the game. There's some great coaching sevens, um, rugby toolbox uh, resources just around, well, all sorts really. Um, so have a look at those. Um, they can really help with coaching your teams um, and referees might even understand a bit more about the patterns of play and what's happening and what teams are trying to achieve as well. One of the links I've put in on the sevens referee development page um, is the technical video uh, from the, if this, basically the Sevens ref, uh, law briefing ref video from the World Series. Um, not because I expect our referees to be World Sevens level referees, but it does, I'm not gonna play the whole video because it's 17 minutes long, but it's very simple. It's it's It shows basically what the laws are, uh, what some priorities are around tackler, and it shows some uh, really basic clips, really basic pictures around what, what is expected for each. Okay. And it, so it's, it's so, and it has little uh, captions down the bottom that it has captions down the bottom that show uh, what, it, what it is that you're looking for uh, in that video and what it shows. So I highly recommend it to anyone that, uh, that's involved in sevens this, um, this season that these will show you best best practice and some so what to do and what not to do kind of thing for players and also pictures for referees what what does not supporting body weight look like what does um throwing the ball away kicking the ball away look like um what does uh you know uh yeah all sorts so really really good video has really great notes it's simple and effective so um yeah have a good look at that and share that around because that'll really help us um all understand the game a little bit better we may not be playing to that level. We may not be referring to that level, but certainly we can we can help us get better, and that's the main thing. Cool. So just recapping tonight, guys, and I won't provide an opportunity for any more questions or input. Um, but hopefully, we've had an opportunity to uh, see how law is applied differently to the, in the game of sevens. Um, uh, the key differences in law. So we covered those at the start. Um, hopefully, we, this will help to create some consistency in refereeing across our tournaments and better understanding from our rugby public as a whole. Um, during seven tournaments, and um, you've all had an opportunity at least uh, to provide some input or ask some questions. Um, so, without further ado, I will just, uh, if there are any questions or further input, just now is a great opportunity. No, cool. All right. Um, so for our referees in particular, oh, so firstly for any coaches on board tonight, thank you so much for joining. It was really uh, great to um, have you along. It's great to create some shared um, uh, understandings and uh, 
being I, I always a big advocate for um, for coaches being a part of um, referee, I guess briefings and and education and everything like that because essentially the, the referee is controlling and shaping and guiding what happens on the field. So you may as well coach to it. <laughs> um, the referees, uh, if you haven't done so already, then make sure you do sign up for our um, the, for the events that you do want to get amongst. Um, check out our um, web pages if you haven't already. Uh, coaches go there too. Check out those. Um, actually, I will just navigate towards them if you're still on. So share my screen. So under appointments, there's um, tournaments. It just shows about how um, how to get involved with um, refereeing our tournaments. And in terms of our development, so education and development, uh, we have our sevens developments. So again, here's where those some of those great links were. Uh, it talks about what some of the stuff we talked about tonight. It has the slides that I've just gone through, the links there, and it has um, that technical video as well, which is a really great watch. So have a little look, have a little read, immerse yourself in a bit of a uh, bit of learning uh, for sevens. Um, and I really appreciate your time and joining me tonight. So thank you so much.